we're looking at a new reality. And whether you are uh, blown up by an improvised explosive device in Afghanistan, like an IED, or whether you are felled by a ton of rock or a building coming down on you, which is what's happened in Nepal, which is what's happened in Haiti, uh, you have suffered some sort of early intervention catastrophic injury. At some point, we move from the trauma to the uh, basic human needs, clean water, uh, power, um, lighting, electricity, disease prevention, uh, trying to uh, prevent um, infectious disease from sort of breeding with contaminated sewage or contaminated water. But in those first few hours to several days, we're really dealing with how do we pick up the pieces from trauma. What has been the, the game changer that has allowed us to say to a mother or father in this country, if you send your son or daughter into war in Iraq or Afghanistan and they receive life-threatening wounds, if we can keep them alive from the field to the first point of resuscitation, they have a greater than 97% chance of remaining alive. And that's almost unheard of. What is the average length of time today if a Marine out in the Helmand province steps on an IED and loses both legs from that point of injury? What's the average time that they are in a ICU bed in Bethesda or Brook? 72 hours. And our good friends at the Air Force uh, make that happen. The Air Force flies the flying ICUs and the C-131s, and you are safer in an Air Force ICU at 30,000 feet in the air. You are safer with the Air Force in an ICU than you are in 90% of the ICUs in this country. When I would walk into the OR at Kandahar, it would be uncomfortably warm. I mean, the doctors are sweating, the nurses are sweating, uh, because that buys time from shock. And the other thing we've learned is simultaneous procedures now. And so we address orthopedic injuries, in total, we don't do one leg, then the other leg, and we bring in the thoracic surgeon in to look at the chest wound. Everybody's in it together. You're doing all the surgery together. It's very intensive. You may have three different specialties of surgeons sitting around the table operating all at once. You're not anesthetizing the patient, doing one thing, letting him sort of recover from that, bringing him back and doing the next thing, all at once. So we have a tsunami of people coming out of the service with post-traumatic stress and with mild, moderate, and severe traumatic brain injury. They're going to wash up on your shores. So cities not only have to deal with the influx of trauma in an earthquake or a hurricane or a terror act, but you're going to have to deal with the generation of service people coming off the rolls who also need emotional support from traumatic brain injury and from post-traumatic stress. This is coming. We're going to eventually have the uh, Million Dollar Man uh, uh, robotic arm uh, that's controlled. We're already starting to see that. I've never been anywhere where there's a city that's more attuned and leaning so far forward and trying to find uh, people to work with um, and, and relationships to build within the military and within the interagency. And our job as leaders, our job as leaders is to be faithful to that paramedic, to that EMT, to that mom or that dad who's going to be heroic in the, in the instance of, an, of a catastrophe in the Bay Area. There's going to be thousands and thousands of heroes that are going to jump in and do life-saving things. Our job as leaders is not to let them down and build the communication system and build the command and control structure that allows them to flawlessly have their heroic results translated into a system that still maintains itself as well as possible with as few conflicts at the interagency and at the leadership level as possible. This venue, I think, goes a long way to do that. So thank you in advance for the difference you're going to make to that mom, to that dad, to that young child who has no idea that all of a sudden catastrophe is around the corner. And when they fall, your leadership will be there to catch them. The earthquake that occurred on the 25th of April, it was during the mid-afternoon, 11.56, and lasted for almost one minute. And uh, the magnitude was 7.8 in the rector scale. Immediately following the earthquake, I went to the army headquarters, the army headquarters was gone, was totally damaged. And it was totally a chaotic scene. So we opened up an operation cell in the airport. This is mainly because a lot of international medical teams were coming in to the country. And also because most of the evacuations, case evacs, were done through the airport and through the hospital. So you opened up an operation cell there also. And then in the army headquarters, we had a multinational military medical 
Military Coordination Center, MNMCC, and there we had a operation cell there also, which was coordinating all the multinational medical, military medical teams that were coming into the country. We started sending medical teams in the remote areas, small, small medical teams, three to, comprising of three to four people, go to pockets, pockets, drop them in pocket, pockets, treat patients. So what we did was we changed our strategy and we sent the helicopters, the few helicopters that the country had, the army has around seven to eight helicopters, plus another seven to eight from the civil side. So we are sending helicopters with medics, then picking up patients, picking up patients from pockets, pockets, and bringing them back to the center because this was the place where they could be treated. Now, we did have many issues and challenges. The first issue was one door policy. Immediately after the earthquake, what the government did was all the relief materials, all the rescue people that are coming, they should go through one door, that is the government. They cannot go immediately. In a way, that sounds okay because it avoids duplications and it also gives transparency and accountability, but it backfired on the government. The second was preparedness, because as I told you, Nepal earthquake was something which was waiting to be happening any time. And thanks to the US government, because we had a lot of exercises along with the US military, especially in the medical side. And we had live exercises also, first responders conducting search and rescue, medical evacuations. That helped us a lot. There was no news flowing in. The only news was from radios. So few of the radios that were operating, especially the national radio, Radio Nepal, that was operating, they were the ones who were providing information. The mobile system, though it was working in some of the places, but in the remote areas, especially in the villages, especially the towns were totally out. It was not working there. And I would say during this time, basically it was the social media that did a wonderful job. Facebook started a campaign called Mark safe. So we knew that people were safe. Earthquake cannot be predicted, neither can it be prevented, but definitely the damages it does can be lessened to a great extent. And for that, I would say preparedness is the key to success. During the last week I was at Chulai, the hospital ship Repose uh, came to Vietnam. And the hospital ship Repose had a full complement of <clears throat> operating rooms, surgeons, nurses, corpsmen, and could take care of just about anything. They had, at the same time, in 19, early 1966, they developed the Naval Station Hospital in Da Nang, and that was a facility which took about six months to build. Both of these facilities had the, had the frozen blood program, which had been developed at the U.S. Naval Hospital Chelsea during the early 60s. What are some of the realities of trauma care in a disaster situation? For those of you that aren't familiar with this, the nine line is our equivalent of calling 911. It doesn't matter what you receive on the nine line, whatever shows up is gonna be completely different from what you anticipated. So you have to be prepared for the unexpected. Acidosis, coagulopathy, hypothermia, the Admiral spoke about this earlier in TCCC. This is the triad of death. We always say that we're trying to prevent these things. The reality is in a disaster situation, you're gonna be chasing these things the whole time. Freeze-dried plasma. Other than our Israeli guests, does anybody have any experience giving freeze-dried plasma? So this is the future, this is where we're going. Right now there's two products. There's one from France, there's one from Germany. Several units in the States have an investigational drug approval for the French product. But if we just talked about all the rates of breakage and how hard it is to get frozen baggies of FFP around the world, what if you had something that was shelf-stable in a bottle and you could just reconstitute and give? Yes, maybe not as good as whole blood, but a whole lot better than normal saline, ringers, or Hextend. The differences between the two, single donor, pooled, pooled donor, uh, I've seen the, the setup that the Israelis have. The French is two large, thin bottles, and the German product is from a much smaller, thicker, heavier bottle. So logistically, uh, maybe, maybe the, the, the German product is gonna be the wave of the future. But if you don't know about FTP, FDP, it's coming soon. It's gonna go, uh, it's gonna expand its use in the military and we're gonna see it on the civilian side as well. What's the take home? Fresh whole blood, it's the most advantageous logistical profile in a disaster situation. You're not gonna have access to anything that you've planned to have access to, but what you do is you have access to other people. And we talked about that. There's still some risk. There's a risk of infectious disease. There's a risk of reaction. The common argument you'll hear though is, I would rather be alive to complain about whatever infectious disease was transmitted to me. 
just like you hear when you talk about all the severe, talk to all the severely wounded servicemen and women that come back, yes, they have some challenges and they have medical issues they're going to deal with the rest of their life, but they're alive to challenge those issues. This is the structure of the field hospital. We've got the different uh, department, the ER, the OR, the ICU, we've got the inpatient uh, department and the auxiliary services. Uh, we try to refine that based on what we get from our uh, first response team. The mission to Nepal uh, addressed uh, uh, primarily uh, the earthquake-related uh, injuries, but also uh, was built uh, to treat uh, local population for not uh, earthquake-related uh, injuries. And this required uh, to adjust accordingly the equipment and uh, the medical personnel uh, team of the uh, hospital. Uh, the hospital staff uh, consisted of uh, 126 people, 45 physicians, and I have to admit those were amazing physicians, heads of the, some of the uh, elite uh, medical facility units who are uh, on reserves in the active duties, especially in ICU. Uh, from the monetary point of view, United States provided uh, uh, the largest uh, monetary support uh, to uh, Nepal uh, during the earthquake. Um, Israeli uh, field hospital uh, was also uh, the one that performed a larger number of surgical procedures. You can see the layout and how the facility was built and spread, uh, pretty much every possible uh, uh, unit. We try to be as independent uh, as we can in terms of logistics and medical capabilities. We know and understand we need to respect and, and consider the local culture uh, needs and, and way of uh, work and we really need to do uh, the teamwork and collaborate uh, together. We used to think ABC, really it's more, let's get that bleeding stopped as aggressively as possible and then um, uh, move through these other point of wounding care, life-saving interventions at the point of wounding and including um, you know, sealing an open chest seal or needle decompression um, and thinking about intravenous access, not right there on the spot, but at least recognizing that it that may be appropriate at some point. And clearly hypothermia, as other speakers have addressed, um, and that critical uh, triad of death, the coagulopathy, the acidosis, and hypothermia, understanding that those are what kills people in addition to the hypovolemia. So if we can address all of those early and aggressive, we can make a difference. So again, part of our training, as soon as we can resolve the tactical situation and provide security for our responders, we get those medical personnel. This is just a scenario, but all the scenarios we do, we make very realistic and we do them over and over, and we drill in there the multidiscipline, multi-agency coordination and collaboration that critical for appropriate patient outcomes. So in hemorrhage control, you know, I think we can clearly differentiate between external and internal. And internal, we know there really is no field fix it. Yes, we can uh, apply some pressure there. We can um, use tranexamic acid to help with an early phase of hypovolemia. But really, that's a surgical intervention. And we just want all of our responders to understand that and appreciate that there is no field fix for that lacerated spleen or liver or, or mesentery tear from a ballistic penetrating piece of shrapnel. That has to be at the OR, and it has to be done quickly. So we know tourniquets had an undeserved bad reputation. Thankfully, they're back. It took a while, but we see very little or no problem with the use. Um, and certainly, the unfortunate IED type uh, injuries that were so prevalent overseas had led to the, um, you know, the initiation and reinvigoration of the application of tourniquets in the field aggressively and appropriately. So there are a couple different types. But the process are high and tight for a hasty tourniquet, and that's just shutting off the flow. Stop the flow, and that really, you're done at least temporarily. It buys you some time to move the casualty, get them to a safe location, move them to more definitive care. I'll leave you with this. This is when I'm training civilians, law enforcement, uh, or people who aren't really quote unquote medical. You know, there is so much encyclopedic volume of information in the medical world, we can inundate and overwhelm people very quickly. So if we want to keep it very simple, assuming the scene is safe, I teach the SWAT operators, I teach them this. Bleeding, get that under control, make sure air is moving in and out, and then make a decision. Is the decision patient evacuated, medical in, do we stuff them in the room while we, while we clear for other bad guys, or, or, or stabilize the building, et cetera, et cetera. So for, uh, people can understand this conceptually, 
and it does address the life-threatening aspects um, of, of uh, hemorrhage control uh, very quickly. We have evolved into trauma care, and what we need to do, of course, is to get that down to the uh, deck plate, as we say in the Navy, to the street level, to the tactical level. The studies have now shown that you can save somebody who is undergoing a cardiopulmonary arrest. You can actually increase their chance of survival by jumping up on their chest and doing chest compressions. When in doubt, you can't really harm somebody who you can't feel a pulse in by trying to automatically shock them. We need to get that same grassroots understanding of trauma, not because people are going to be in an environment where they're constantly being shot at or in a SWAT environment, but in a city where now a Boston bomb can go off, a earthquake can occur, we have to get, we as leaders have to get this commonplace knowledge of what you can do to stop bleeding. What a great lecture to close on this morning to simply say, if you see some bleeding, try to stop it. The last thing I would tell you is something that has been a complete revolution and I, I sit on the Recovering Warrior Task Force uh, and we've changed the entire way we do it on those odd uh, times when you get an, a, a penetrating eye injury or you get a facial trauma where the eye has been severely damaged, we have learned that the worst thing you can do for an ocular injury is put direct pressure dressing on it. The, the trick is to use something like a fox eye shield, which you put over the eye to protect it from pressure, and then you wrap the bandage around that to keep the eye from getting bumped, bruised, or whatever. Um, and that was something that, uh, before the war started, we didn't know.